All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back from the break. Uh, we're here with our next panel on leveraging technology for growth. Uh, so let me start with just uh, who I am. I'm Kevin Canal. I'm the CTO at WorkTruck Solutions. This is my second ever uh, CVBS uh, panel that I've got to participate in. So excited to hear for my second one. Uh, I have a background in computer science uh, and I've been at startup companies pretty much all of my career. And I think that's probably why Catherine asked me to be here today. Startups are always focused on growth, and I sit on the tech side of the company. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time with commercial dealerships, uh, understanding their challenges, the tools they have today available today, how we can help um, augment that and improve their business, their relationships with customers. I also look at data and insights on vehicle movement, on lot inventory, uh, and, and share that with body manufacturers and distributors. And then, of course, with my own team, I'm looking at new technologies, the tech stack, addressing security needs, and also helping uh, build and grow our team. <clears throat> so a lot of technology-related items there, but uh, I've got some more exciting people than me here uh, that are doing some amazing things in the commercial space. So uh, I've got Jamil Gada, the Chief Strategy Officer at PAVE. Uh, Jamil has a background with new product innovation at Cox. Uh, he's worked at AI companies and a number of prior auto uh, experience as well. Uh, we have Ethan and uh, Dolson. Uh, he's the president and CEO of SOAR, founder of SOAR, I should say, uh, which has a really broad offering for dealerships from websites to digital marketing to national marketplace. Uh, Ethan touches a lot of it. And then Eric Foster, he's our panelist in the fintech space. Uh, he's the head of marketing and business biz dev at Takecore Financial. And uh, Eric's tied to a couple of us here. He's got integrations uh, with his company at uh, Convoy.com and SOAR. So uh, let me... I'll let you guys take it a little bit further than I just did, and uh, I'll, I'll go around the room. Jamil, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so as Kevin said, you know, my name is Jamil Gada. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at PAVE. Uh, we're a digital inspection company that produces automated condition reports. Uh, we primarily focus on uh, dealer inventory as well as fleet commercial fleets. So um, really happy to be here today to talk about how um, technology has not only impacted our product and service, but the broader commercial vehicle market uh, overall. So thank you, Kevin. All right, thanks, Jamil. Uh, Ethan, Ethan, over to you at SOAR. Yeah, I'm Ethan Nadolson, and I'm the founder, CEO, and president of SOAR. We uh, built SOAR back in 1995. So we've been uh, through a lot of different changes and adoption of different technologies, including the internet, uh, in its in its early infancy and in the uh, evolution of all of this. So yeah, very excited to be here. And as Kevin said, we touch a lot of points in the industry. There's four pillars that we look at. Uh, it's typically around inventory, but we do full dealership uh, websites and and other services. But uh, inspect, manage, promote and finance are our four pillars that we look at as the uh, SOAR stands for sold on arrival. So the whole point is by the time you do a quality inspection or appraisal of that truck, uh, by the time you have that done, then you can pre-sell that unit before you ever even take it into inventory. And then once it's in inventory, you can manage it and uh, then off to promoting it across the internet on several different platforms, including work truck solutions and Convoy, uh, we've got a we've got an interface there, and then on the finance side, uh, that's where kind of the rubber meets the road. You got to figure out how to pay for this truck, right? So that's where uh, we've we've interfaced with Takeor and we built a product we call Finance Hub to to take care of that. So that's our our product offering. Again, very excited to be here, and um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to join in this discussion with with these guys. So all right, thanks. Thank I, I love the uh, sold on arrival. Uh, definition of SOAR, you know, and I think in uh, um, the the inventory shortages we saw over the, you know, last year or so, uh, that that played out even more than ever, right, with the, the ability oh, yeah. to, to market what your vehicle is and, and make sure you got that data and um, info about it, because it's most likely going to get sold on arrival, so. Or, uh, or before. <laughs> or before, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, Eric, uh, I'll let you jump in here. Uh, great to be here. Uh, Eric Foster. Um... Takeor is a uh, tech forward uh, commercial finance company. We've been in business for over 30 years. Our goal is really to make uh, transactions as smooth as possible. So we've developed both technology solutions as well as financial products to make that um, easier and easier. 
um, for our customers and our partners like yourselves. All right. Thanks, Eric. And uh, okay, so when when I was looking at all, all of our respective companies, you know, kind of trying to see what ties us all together. And um, it was kind of interesting that I saw, like, as I looked at the homepage or the, you know, what, what our company's about, technology was right there. Like all of us um, ha- have that, even just the keyword technology, uh, pretty front and center with our companies. So l- let's just expand a little bit further the, on, you know, what, what we're already been talking about, you know, who our companies are, but how, what's the role? What is, you know, how is technology such a key part um, and Jamil, I'll start with you on the PAVE side of things. Clearly, technology and um, what we can do in apps and data collection is has got to be a key part of PAVE. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. I mean, I think, you know, when I think more broadly uh, about commercial fleet managers, commercial fleet owners, um, you know, in my opinion, there, there's a need, right, for innovative technology solutions to help streamline a number of their processes, whether it's vehicle acquisition, which I'm sure we'll talk about at length, you know, disposal, retirement, uh, monitoring of those vehicles, and of course, maintenance processes as well. Um, So you'll see pieces of those processes that have technology interwoven into, into them, whether it's platforms that are being used to acquire, dispose, whether it's systems that are being used to monitor or maintain. Uh, and really where we fit into that uh, as a company here at PAVE is we give um, commercial uh, vehicle owners and managers uh, and potential shoppers and buyers the ability to understand uh, the comprehensive condition of that vehicle by simply taking taking photos uh, of the vehicle. Uh, we then analyze those photos. So we, we have a um, a process that's supported by advanced uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that's able to then take that uh, and produce a a graded condition report that has um, line item uh, damage uh, identification, classification, and then estimates for repair. So um, that's how we fit into the overall puzzle. But of course, technology plays a much broader role, in my opinion, across the entire ecosystem uh, of the life cycle of a commercial vehicle. Uh, agreed, definitely. And and thanks for opening the door on the AI uh, keyword as well in the technology space. We'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, but but Ethan, you know, with, with the broad offering that you guys have, you know, how do you, you know, has technology been key in having that di- diverse portfolio and how you're able to help uh, dealers? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, a lot of times we're waiting on technology to uh, evolve for us to go to the next level. Uh, for example, you know, like I mentioned, we started in 95, but we had this concept that even back on the Blackberries and uh, pocket PCs and everything of being able to do an appraisal right on your phone, uh, kind of like, you know, PAVE does, you know, but being able to do that right on a right on a smartphone of some sort. And back then, you know, but we were just limited by the technology and the capabilities and the quality of the cameras. So some of it is just waiting for technology to catch up to the ideas that we have and be able to handle it. Um, and I'm going to jump into the AI thing for half a second. I know we're going to talk about that more, it sounds like. But, um, you know, we're also, we're all watching AI and watching it evolve. And uh, it's similar to back in the 90s when we were watching the internet evolve and technology evolve with uh, iPads now and and different technology that's, that's in your hand that's more powerful than, you know, we could have imagined uh, 30 years ago. And now we now we have that, and uh, not only is that a very common place, uh, which also had to happen before a lot of these things could happen. Even some of the digital um, opportunities and security around, you know, for Eric, like credit applications and things like that. I mean, all all of that had to evolve and get to a point where it's not only feasible, um, and I think it's important to call out, you know, technology for the sake of technology is not a positive thing. Technology for the sake of improving a process or um, something like that. We battled this years ago watching, you know, 30 different platforms that you can put your inventory on. Well, okay, now you have to have somebody go to all 30 platforms and input their inventory and there was no way. So it actually created a lot of problems for dealerships back in uh, early 2000s because now they had 30 platforms they were trying to keep up with. And the answer is they just didn't do it or didn't do it well. And they were misrepresenting their inventory. And so as technologies evolved and APIs and all this got more advanced, it gives us the opportunity to do that. So 
I think I'm answering your question there, Kevin. Yeah, for sure. I I, I definitely relate to um, a lot of different platforms that that do, that our customers, our dealers uh, have to, you know, use today to to you know everything from the prospecting side all the way to the the sale and and financing side of things. And the, there's there's a lot. And so the you know what I think of our, one of our missions is to help make that easier, right? Like how can you know the technology that we offer help tie those things together better or to you know, just make it easier to understand and navigate and get your your job done. So, so Eric, uh, you know what what these companies are doing it must help you on, on uh, your side. So, when it comes to fintech, um, technology is clearly uh, you know been something that's been helping enable fintech and and what you guys do. Why don't you expand a little bit from there? Sure, absolutely. Um, technology is most certainly at the center of what we do um, for the. First and foremost, buying a vehicle or an upfit is a third party um, finance company involved. You have multiple, you have a buyer, you have a seller. It gets very complicated very fast, and technology helps to simplify it. Uh, technology also helps to mitigate the risk associated with that transaction for the buyer. It helps provide transparency um, for the seller trying to um, win a buyer's uh, interest in a particular piece of equipment and most certainly helps us as the finance company mitigate risks for all parties, right? So whether it's what Jamil is doing in terms of being able to provide a, a quality inspection report or what Ethan's doing in terms of being able to um, essentially uh, diagnose uh, what we're actually um, potentially going to be financing and whether the vehicle it is today was the vehicle it was when it rolled off the uh, manufacturing floor uh, several years ago is all very helpful to us underwriting a good deal that's sustainable. And um, without technology, I don't think uh, our company would be where it is today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to uh, make sure is that the audience knows is that, uh, you know, hopefully you've got a little bit of a taste for how all these companies are leveraging technology. And I'm, I'm hoping that you all get something out of this as well. So anytime today as we're, we're going through the topics we do, uh, feel free to to put questions in, and uh, um, I'll I'll try and uh, call those out. And and whether it's a technology broad question or something specific for one of our panelists, uh, feel free to um, put those in. All right. So, Eric, uh, what one thing that you had uh, mentioned to me last week when we were just catching up uh, was that in the commercial space, <laughs> technology seems to be moving faster. And you know, you were talking a little bit about how. It's be due to the needs of businesses, right? Like to to make my business more efficient. How can you help me as a as a company? So, uh, is is that something that you are you are seeing play out? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know when we look at adoption curves, um, there's been massive uptake of the Carvanas and the Vrooms and the shifts of the world. Uh, COVID definitely helped, I think, uh, drive market penetration for those uh, business models, but. The one factor that I think exists and is innate to uh, a commercial acquisition versus a personal acquisition is the fact that there's no emotional tie to that purchase. You are very much, as a business owner, buying something to solve a problem, and it's a very practical decision. And the more you can mitigate risk and the more information you have to make an informed decision, the better. And as a result of that, I think what we're all doing in terms of unlocking the potential of big ticket transactions online for commercial is naturally leading to a, a greater and deeper adoption across all uh, levels of the market. Yeah, uh, definitely follow you on that. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of put the continue the conversation in two different directions. So um, for for you, Ethan, I feel like you know, are, are you seeing that commercial need for uh, technology the same as, as kind of Eric seeing and, and Jamil, like, I imagine you're more pushing like technology, look, what, look what we can do uh, with PAVE and look how you can improve your, um, you know, your business with the technology that we can provide. And I'll start with you, Jamil. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. So I think, I mean, when you think about commercial vehicles and, and you know, commercial, commercial fleet owners, um, I mean, they're, they're, their operations, you know, are all about being efficient, right? And, you know, these vehicles are on the road constantly if they're managing their their fleet uh, in an optimal manner. And so, you know, 
being on the road and in use constantly, um, there's a number of, of of things that can happen to that vehicle, right? And there's there's a there's a need to really understand, um, you know, the condition of that vehicle. Is it safe to drive? Um, if there was an event, what happened? How did it occur? What is my liability? You know, what do I need to do to repair the vehicle? So I think if you focus on the maintenance aspect and the monitoring of uh, commercial fleets, uh, technology uh, plays a, a, a really, really interesting role in that. And it allows, in my opinion, uh, the, the fleet owners and the operators to be more proactive. So if you have if you have simple tools um, where, you know, you just like like our, 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 our tool as an example, where you're just taking photos of the vehicle and that's all that's required, you're really de-skilling a process that in the past required wait time. You know, you had to schedule uh, an inspector. Um, yeah, you had to wait for them to come out as costs as expensive, right? And so, you know, instead of having to be reactive uh, to, towards um, how you manage the, the condition of your fleet, um, now you're able to be proactive. And at any point in time, you can you can understand the current condition of that vehicle. So, so I think that's, that's just a, a comment about how you can become more efficient and more proactive with technology as, as you look to manage your, your fleet of commercial vehicles. And yeah, thanks, Jamil. And Ethan, I'll same conversation. Uh, you know, are you seeing that technology adoption in the commercial space? And for you, particularly in the heavy duty space, are, are you seeing that um, do you, from your opinion, you know, growing faster? Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, there's several factors. You know, everybody points to COVID, and I do think that COVID had a had a lot to do with pushing us, pushing us forward. But I think the trend was there anyway. Um and not just in the remarketing of of the assets. I think that's a big one. Um, as you know, Eric was talking about Carvana and some of these other platforms. Uh, that's definitely a direction our industry's been headed. But see, there's a, there's again a, a disconnect. But back, um, my father when when I was creating Soar and and pushing all those things. My father was like, well, no one's ever going to really buy a truck, a semi truck over the internet because you got to touch it and feel it. And you know what? That's been true for a very long time. And I think that is changing now. And we're in the right in the middle of it. And the thing that's changing is just the digital transparency that we can provide and the trust. Uh, you know, like I say, there's, there's three things people are looking for. And Kevin, you hit the nail on the head um, earlier and Eric kind of followed up on it is it's not an emotional transaction. It's a it's a business need. That's why they're buying the buying buying the asset, and uh, so there's does it have the spec? That's number one. If it's you know I'm not going to go buy a logging truck uh, to to do local deliveries. It doesn't make any sense, right? So it's got to be the right spec. Number one. Number two um, is you know can I can I trust the dealership? So now I'm looking at the listing. I'm looking at the uh, quality of the photos that they've taken, the transparency of the damage that's on the unit. And I don't, I mean, hey, I'll buy something with a bent cap extender or, or or some body damage if I know that it's there. The problem becomes if the dealer doesn't disclose it and I show up at the dealership and it's got body damage and, uh, you know, they weren't using using a product or, you know, Jamil, like they didn't, didn't, didn't take a picture of it, right? That's, that's an issue. Uh, or if the engine has codes on it or something like that. So as that digital transparency uh, becomes more more commonplace, I think that's important. And then the third is, you know, then how do I how do I buy it? And that's what those are the three things that every buyer is looking for. And certainly, there's different um, different buyers out there. Maybe some of them are, are you know have to go put their hands on something. But for us to get to this true digital environment, those are the three things that have to happen. And those are happening now. And we have that because now they have a process where, you know, our whole concept is that they can shop, look for, and buy a truck from the bunk of their truck. They can be sitting in their bunk on a 3G network and and literally go through the entire buying process with a dealership. And then the dealership walks in in the morning with a credit application sitting there. And, um, and then that runs into approval. So... And when that becomes more transparent from your computer or your smartphone, that's when you truly see that transition. Because if it's easier and safer for me to buy virtually, 
that's when I'm going to elect to buy virtually versus in person. I don't have the pressure. I have the time to really contemplate options and I can make a more informed decision. And I think those are factors that are so critical and that are leading to e-commerce being a at least part of that buying decision um, in in online transactions for commercial customers. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I'll just add, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, to your point, Eric, uh, about retail. So you know, when you think about the frequency of, of the process or the frequency of the acquisition or, or the disposal, um, on the commercial side, of course, it's much more frequent. And so, you know, the adoption to try to, figure out ways to do that more efficiently, more effectively, uh, you know, with transparent and symmetrical information um, is, is, is on the table. And I think people are, 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 you know, definitely open to it as opposed to, you know, perhaps when you look at, um, you know, one, one of us or, 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 the, or the retail sector, you know, th- those, those, those transactions occur, you know, once every three years in a longer time horizon. And so, yeah, they're more invested in it and maybe they just want to make sure that, um, yeah, they do much, much more shopping, much more uh, in-person um, sort of assessments of the vehicle, um, and they're less concerned with um, you know making sure it's efficient and effective. Yeah, the new car smell is still important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ethan, uh, you know, I, I agree that you know things have moved pretty quickly from you know this is never going to happen a transaction online in, in our space, and uh, clearly it, it is happening now and. And some dealerships, I feel, are embracing that. And uh, we talked a little bit about that. I, you know that, and I liked what you were saying about transparency being really important. Um, one of the dealers I've, I've spent some time with was Dan, who was a panelist uh, from Reichert earlier here today. Uh, and he, he, one of the things that I liked that he was talking about was his um, his dealership's mentality around helping the small businesses in, in their area. And his ability to know more about that customer's fleet actually helps him serve his customers better, um, whether it's, you know, the, the usage data, the fleet and the, you know, um, for on the repair side or, you know, when, you know, or the, his mobile service, you know, there's just a lot of uh, that transparency being there helps him. So, uh, Jamil, like I'll, I'll let you start off on this one, you know, so do you see a change there in the, or or importance there in transparency as, as a dealership, you know, as we're talking about here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, look, anytime um, you understand your customers and your clients better, that 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 helps you as a service provider, whether you're a dealer, um, whether you're a, a fleet services provider, a commercial fleet services provider, or or anything in between, you know, understanding, doing customer discovery, understanding the problem, understanding how their business works, right? That's going to help you make sure that your solution uh, is a good fit for them overall. Um, and yeah, I think as it relates to um, purchasing vehicles, uh, remotely um, uh, online. Um, to your point, symmetrical and the symmetry of information um, for both parties is important. And so, you know, I think from a listing perspective, making sure um, you not only understand exactly, you know, what type of vehicle that is, whatever sort of upfit it's had, you know, wh- where it's where it's been in its useful life, but also augmenting it with what can we understand, uh, you know, by analyzing the images of that vehicle. That maybe we can't get from other information sources uh, from a VIN decode or other things like that. And then on the on the buy side, yeah, any sort of protective products that would allow peace of mind uh, would would certainly help um, you know, further the the share of the pie of online transactions, uh, in my opinion. And I'll just add that I think transparency is critical, but I think the next phase is about empowerment. I think the next phase is about. I can configure the vehicle I want better online than I could if I was sitting in the store trying to understand all the jargon that somebody at the dealership was was, um, uh, speaking at me with. Um, Or, um, you know, being able to, as a dealership, and being empowered by being able to provide in-depth information about extended warranty or being able to participate in the actual financing itself. And I think where technology is headed is that empowerment of both the consumer and the seller to ultimately buy and sell a better product for the need of that particular customer. And that is very important, I think, to our commercial customers. Yeah, I I, I like that empowering the buyer. Uh, and I think that applies tremendously to the commercial space, right? There's a lot of unique needs 
of that small business and how they, you know, want to use their vehicle. And, and maybe if you think in the past, you know, you're, you're, you're might dealing with a regional area that, you know, only tries to push like a certain type of, of manufacturer or, you know, the, whether it's a refrigeration unit or the crane, or, you know, like you think that there are a lot of different manufacturers across the country that might be more beneficial to your small business's needs. Uh, and so that, that, that plays right off of what you're saying, Eric, is that, um, empowering that buyer to get more information about what this vehicle has or what are other options that are out there. Um, Ethan, do you see uh, on that heavy duty space and how, how are you guys, you know, helping, you know, that, that transparency to your customers in the dealerships? Are they adopting that same mentality? Kind of what do you think compared to the, the light and medium duty OEMs? Yeah, I think uh, for sure. And, you know, the, Heavy duty space is very relationship driven. And uh, I mean, the commercial truck business is in general, um, espe- especially over like the retail environment where, um, you know, it, it's a little bit less on, on the relationship, um, should be more on the relationship. But uh, on the commercial truck side, you're trying to sell them their third truck is what we always say. I'm not trying to sell your first truck. I'm trying to sell your third truck because you want them back. And um get them back in the door, right? Or the fleet, you want to keep their business or whoever it is. So uh, I think the relationship's always been important. I think that the speed at which you communicate, unfortunately, um, you know, back when the fax machine came out, it was it was a game changer because now you can fax something to somebody and they can get the information quicker. And then FedEx, you could send them photos in the in the mail overnight and they could get it the next day was a game changer. The the uh, email was a game changer. And now that we're kind of taking that and evolving it, uh, Kevin, I, I think really all the fundamentals are there. Uh, the, the fundamentals of what we do are still the same and those are not really changing. It's just we're making a, a better process, a more transparent process, because in the past, the customer would have to come to your lot. They'd look at the truck themselves. They'd walk around it and do all that. And we're, we're just removing that step from the process and just making it easier and better for the client. And, and and eliminating those geographic constraints that 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 was inherent with that model. Now you can buy across the country and you can find the best deal not just within your local area but literally within the continental United States. Or, or I would argue even best spec, Eric, right? Yeah. Um so to your point. So I, I think it's it's also best spec because uh, you know, we've had dealers buy uh, dealers from Alaska buy trucks in Florida because they could find the right the right spec, and I mean it's it's that important, and that's all because of the internet and the way that uh, we can communicate today and have that transparency. And so what we we try to bring is here's the here's a here's a copy or here's the information off the engine so that they understand the fault codes and a lot of the different information uh, that's coming directly off the ECM. So they can look at that. And that's that's a game changer. Being able to see condition photos, if that's something the dealership wants to share, being able to share uh vehicle history reports, you know, like uh for for on the truck side, title history, all the rest of those things that just instill that trust and uh go go further to uh Eric empower the uh the dealer and also the customer to have that level of trust that they know that they're buying a quality asset and um can can do that business across across the country across the globe i mean it doesn't matter where you are anymore yeah i, I can't imagine uh you know a, a ways back you'd think if there would be too many sales from uh florida to alaska so yeah that's yeah, a great example of of uh, the things changing so th- thinking about changing and <clears throat> and growth let's let's pivot a little bit to um you know your hires and and you know, talking to the audience a little bit, you know, how, how do you keep your companies fresh? You know, Ethan, yours has been around a long time. Um, how are you guys all looking at hiring? And are you looking, you know, I know one of the other panels was talking about um, the, this as well, you know, how, do you see the need to like do more training with your current team? Um, or is it more, do you look to approach uh, adopting technology by, by new hires? Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Jamil. Yeah, I mean, I think it it depends on the on the company and the the services that they're providing, as well as the 
the talent that's required to deliver those services. Um, I mean, from our perspective, if we're talking like on the engineering team or the product team, um, you know, we work pretty closely with um, an institute in, in Toronto called the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, and um, they're one of the premier research institutes in the in the world, and and they um, help us source our machine learning talent um, as well as our uh, our higher level engineering talent. Um, and then when uh, maybe on the other side of the coin, when you're interacting uh, with your customers and your clients. Um, when you're when you're um, delivering a product that is is a stepwise change and what they do today and how they operate that process today, I think it's very important to help uh, manage and performance manage uh, the client through that process change. And so we look for for uh, teammates that are really good at uh, relationship management, understanding the the business to your earlier point um, that the client. Um, has it and where they're going to use the service and and then how to best fit uh, the technology solution into that process so it provides you know either the efficiency or the optionality that they may not have had previously. Yeah, it, so- it sounds like you have you have a pretty knowledgeable you know skill set uh, at the company. You know, just thinking about even the need to go to a, an AI company to find people that are uh, strong on machine learning. And what I thought was ironic for a second is like your end application is meant to help um, reduce the skill set and knowledge needed, uh, you know, in the space, you know, to be able to just take a picture of the of the car. So um, yeah, that's kind of a, a fascinating way to look at things. Um, Eric, are you, you know, uh, on the fintech side and, and where you're at, like, you know, is, is so much uh, change happening so quickly? How does, you know, your company... Um, staying up to date and and making sure that you guys continue to be leaders in the um, fintech and technology space. How do you guys handle that? Adoption is always a challenge. Um, but what's, I think, beneficial today is uh, the marketplace, for the most part, has caught up um, to the latest technology and uses the latest technology on a personal basis, if not uh, a professional basis daily now. So we find that it is easier for our teams to adopt technologies as long as we're not asking them to step outside of the technologies that they're used to in their day-to-day lives, right? Um, So if uh, we're introducing a machine learning algorithm, we may introduce that slower, and if we're simply introducing a new interface for um, our credit teams to uh, score deals. So depending on the type of technology and uh, the level of sophistication of that technology, we'll either move slower or faster accordingly. Ethan, I think you, you might be the most interesting uh, one for this question, just because the company has been around since, what was it, 95, 96? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the world's changed so much. Uh, technology's changed so much. How, how are you uh, keeping sore at the forefront of all this? Yeah, I mean, we're we're very technology forward. So we're we're always looking at, like I said earlier, where a lot of times we're waiting for technology to catch up with our ideas and where we want to go with it. And so, you know, whatever iteration you see of our system, we're probably four or five uh, down the line in in our thinking and our in our road mapping of whatever you see today. Um, at least, and not only in our core core products, but also in our um, other paths that we're going down. We've got we've got more ideas and more more directions that than than we have time to do. So, uh, you know, that's it. and as far as the technology side goes, um, I guess let me let me kind of back that one up a little bit and say, as we hire, the most important thing to me isn't your degree. Because the degree doesn't necessarily mean, and I know there's a lot of people that are going to disagree with me on this potentially, but it's not the degree that I'm looking for. The degrees are fantastic. I mean, I'm not downplaying any any of that. But what I'm looking for is somebody that's passionate about their trade. Uh, and to give an example, we had uh, somebody come in uh, to interview for a position in our web development side. And they're a graphics artist, and they came from a um, very well-known graphics local graphics art school and they had all the right things and uh we sat down with them and we were talking to them and um you know we 
our strategy is to get people more comfortable, take them to lunch, see how they treat the servers, treat, see how they do treat people out in the out in the wild, you know, and because um, that tells you a lot about somebody. And we were uh, talking to this individual and just got comfortable, maybe a little too comfortable. And they they said, well, you know, man, I really got burnt out on doing graphics when I was at school because they just had us do them over and over and over. I'm like, you're not the right guy for us. I mean, if you're burnt out and we ended up hiring the guy, you ask him, what do you do? And, uh, you know, someone will be like, oh, I program on the side. And what do you do for fun? I build video games or I do this or I do that. It's like, OK, well, you you really you're, you're passionate about what you do. The guy we ended up hiring, uh, he he and his friends get together on the weekends and, and draw comic books. It's like, OK, well, you're our guy. So we're looking for that passion uh, in in people. And, you know, when you find that, then you can direct it. You can teach them. You can mold them. We can teach them about trucks and and uh, our our clients and if they're passionate about what they do i think that's that's important to us i did talk to a dealership recently and uh it was it was pretty interesting and i, I really like what they had to say because they said um they said that they had um uh, you know, they've got existing cl- uh existing employees and they went to them and they said listen you know to work at our company you know going forward you have to embrace technology and not accept technology, not understand that we're going to have technology, but we're going to embrace it. And we're also going to embrace change. So those are two things that um, I think, you know, our company does well is, you know, we we know things are going to change. And believe me, things have changed a lot since 95. So as things change, and as the environment changes, and COVID and, you know, uh, the advancement of different things, that's, that's what we're looking at is that same, that same type of person. Yeah, no, I, I like that, Ethan. And, uh, you know, I, I relate to it a, a lot myself with passion being key, you know, and when I think of hiring uh, developers, uh, you know, I'd, I like that developer that is doing the side project, right? It gets together with their friends and and is working on some project, you know, as opposed to the person that comes in and is just like, oh, yeah, the, the biggest project I've done was the school project, you know, and it's like, yeah. okay, like, you had to do that. But, what you know, what was your passion around, uh, you know, this, in, you know, this space that you're in? And, and if you have that passion, I feel like um, you're you're more open to the the new technologies, right? So when you know here we are and talking about growth and technology, you know passion goes hand in hand with that. You want to learn more, you want to figure out what's next, um, and, and I think that that ties together really well. Um, so an audience question though uh, on this topic, um, where do you find these people? You know, like we're you found that person that that likes to you know do the comic books on the side. You know, uh, any tips for the audience on, on just from hiring and finding that right person. I'll just leave it open to anybody. Oh man. Uh, you know, that's, that's the million dollar question right there is, <laughs> is finding the right people. And uh, you know, we use probably a lot of the the typical sources uh, that, that people would use to, you know, go get resumes and, and all of that stuff in. Um, and then also just through relationships, uh, job fairs, colleges, things like that would be places we would look. But it's, I think it's, for us, it's just more about um, looking through and then trying to find that, that right, that right fit. What yeah, about in the my... commercial? Bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll tee it off also here. Eric. You know, is commercial background important, auto background or, uh, or, or more? Is it FinTech for you guys? Um. You'll hate my answer. I mean, 18 (laughs) years in technology, you know, uh, you develop a professional network. And a lot of the times we source people just through um, people we know within the industry. Um, But yes, uh, when it comes to hiring outside of just technology, um, having some experience in commercial lending or some experience at a dealership level is extremely valuable um, because ultimately those are our partners. That's our audience. So, yeah, makes sense. Jamil, anything you want to add? No, I I think I'll just, you know, uh, add on to Eric's point about the network effect. I think if, if you, if you have a people leader or talent development team, that's really proactive about, putting content out about your company from a, um, a recruitment perspective uh, and building that roster of, of, of who's going to be 
uh, next, uh, potentially next, uh, um, you know, in line to be on the team and just continuing that cycle, then there's a way for you not only to leverage your personal network, but for the company to build a bigger network. And then you can leverage that when roles do come open uh, or you have a need to, um, to, to hire new folks. Well, I think uh, to the audience, what, what we're hearing here is that when it comes to hiring, traditional and relationship and and networking still applies. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, link, LinkedIn's a good one. Maybe th- maybe there's some opportunity there. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, so, cool, what one of the things that uh, that came up about the the transparency and data sharing um, that made me think about it is is security. Is there a concern um, from you know keeping data secure or uh, you, you know, is that a, a threat to you guys, or is it something at, at the forefront of of you know? Does that go hand in hand with the, the transparency we've been talking about? Uh, obviously, for, for you, Eric. I mean, yeah, it's probably... more critical than ever. Yeah, um, our team has to get it right every minute of every day. A hacker only has to get it right one minute, and that is uh, an ever increasing challenge. There's more attacks than ever before. And so whether it's our online finance application being encrypted or our data being encrypted, both at rest and in motion, like we're having to think about all aspects of that. We're having to think about all aspects of our cybersecurity, um, data protections. Thankfully, if you are building your infrastructure in a cloud environment, a lot of the the cloud service providers are already um, providing you with high levels of security. But it just takes one well-worded email to be clicked on, and all of a sudden you've introduced a virus. So it's something we're constantly battling. Yeah, agree, to Jamil or Ethan. Any impact for you guys? Well, I think that? Eric answered that well. I mean, I think you know, depending on on the the process or or the information that you're looking to. Um, secure. There's, to Eric's point, you know, established protocols um, that you just need to remain compliant with, as well as um, to your to Eric's point, if you if you leverage cloud services, um, there's just a litany of of um, of services and bolt-ons available to help you there. Um, I'll say one thing that we that we um, you know make sure of um, at our company is that we're being responsible about PII, and, and so we have not only um, uh, ways that we um, sort of use technology to mask uh, personal information to only really accept what we need. But then if we do um, take that into effectively secure store and, and um, remove it from the system um, when when is it's most appropriate. Yeah, overall, just a, a, ne- a necessary piece of, of what we're all doing. Um, I don't know. Did you want to add anything, Ethan? Yeah, let me let me just add something to that. So I, I think it's not just our systems that that need protecting. I think it's also uh, as we're looking at dealerships specifically and the way that they interact with their customers. Uh, that's another thing that we look at. So you know, part of our finance hub with Takeor is that, um, and and a real problem in the industry is there's a lot of dealerships that you say, hey, send me a credit application. What do they do? They send you a a a PDF. You fill out the PDF and you email it back to the dealership. Now it's in a salesman's hands, or maybe you scan it and I, I don't know what you do with it, you know, but a salesman gets that. And then that goes to somebody else. And there's three or four different hands that have very critical information on it. And I think that's the that's the biggest um risk at a dealership. And then to go to go even deeper on that, Kevin, it would be a question of okay, to get funding, what what else do you what else does every salesman ask for? They ask for uh Driver's bank license, statements. Yeah, proof of insurance, true. bank statements, and how is this getting tax done? Tax returns sometimes. You're you're taking your phone, you're taking a picture of your driver's license and texting it to a salesman. A salesman does that a hundred times. He has a hundred social security numbers with addresses and everything on their phone. I mean, it's a big security risk that um, you know is, is out there. And so th- those are the kind of things that we have to be looking at and thinking about our customer and kind of going back to you have to understand your customer and their processes to understand how to solve the problems for them. So those are the things that we look at is how can we how can we do that? And we had secure online credit applications very early on when um, VeriSign was the only game in town. We we built we started building those, but that's evolved so much over the years that 
Um, that's always been a concern and probably our biggest risk uh, as a as a provider is or the dealership's biggest risk is that credit application um, because and, it's got all their info on it. And I'll just piggyback on that. Simply because you can create an online form doesn't mean you're creating a secure online form. And no. I think there's a lot, a big gap in understanding of yeah. you can get the job done, but what exposure are you giving to your organization as well as your customer by not actually following the appropriate steps? And it sounds like you see that a lot, Ethan. We see that a lot as well. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm sure that we could have a whole panel on security. So I'll, I'll try not to, to take us down that uh, too far. So. Uh, I'll, I'll pivot a little bit here. So, you know, when I think of, of of startups and especially in the technology space, and we're all on the more on the software side of things, um, sometimes you're starting out with, you know, trying to solve a problem, but you're really more excited about like ultimately getting to another point or, and Ethan, you kind of opened this door and topic in my mind of, of like the fact that you're working on five or six things um, down the road. But, uh, you know, what, the question is like, what, what, what are you excited at your company that's coming? Like what, what's, is there a, uh, somewhere you're hoping to be able to grow into or, um, that, that you're working on or, you know, that you're comfortable sharing or talking about, uh, so Jamil at PAVE, you know, what's, what's exciting that's down the road, you know, what, what are we going to see from PAVE in one, two, three years from now? Yeah, no, good question. I, you know, I think, uh, Look, we're a we're an inspection company, and and we're laser focused on being the best digital inspection company in the market. And so, as that process evolves, um, there's lots of ways that you can learn more about the vehicle, right? So, you know, vehicles are becoming more connected. There's ways to ingest that information, and so we can not only understand the um, the cosmetic condition of a vehicle, but also any mechanical uh, fault codes and, you know, have the ability to translate them into plain English that then gets uh, the clients uh, to a more comfortable place assessing the condition risk as it relates to the overall uh, value for the vehicle. Um, you know, in addition, I think as, as we move more to electric vehicles, um, you know, the mechanical risk decreases just due to the makeup of those type of vehicles. So we're focused on how can we really get to a point where for electric vehicles, we feel like um, a photo based inspection solution that ingests a, a bunch of uh, other information about the vehicle from the vehicle is really all you'll need to confidently transact uh, in the market uh, remotely and digitally for those type of units. So we're spending time focusing on that as well. Do you think uh, that what you're doing and similar companies doing is is actually having an impact back into the manufacturing side of things. I mean, hard to tell. I think that they that they we're a little farther downstream from them, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, but I think you know inherently um, those type of uh, uh, vehicles. What I mean, electric vehicles um, are built in a manner where. You, know, you you can you have connectivity uh, via APIs in a lot of cases to understand a lot more about that vehicle. So when you think about the path to gaining symmetrical information about the vehicle, it becomes a lot less of an offline process of a skilled process and much more um, readily available to transact in a manner that that's more convenient and efficient for everybody. All right, Eric, what's what's uh down the road, what are you excited about? What where's the technology growth coming at uh, Takeor? Honestly, I'll answer it both two different ways. So we're very passionate about making sure more customers get approvals. And so on the finance side, we're always looking for new financial instruments, new financial tools, new ways to help more people qualify. And then on the technology side, we're moving uh, from transparency being a real key factor of what we're trying to build to empowerment. And empowerment, I think, is going to be the theme for us for the next couple years, because the more we can empower the customer, the more we can empower the dealership, the better transaction, the smoother transaction, and the happier buying experience people are going to have. And at the end of the day, what I'm passionate about is figuring out how to make it as easy to buy a dump truck online as it is a pair of shoes. And that's what gets me up in the morning. So, yeah, what do we what do we need to do on SOAR and on Convoy to, to make that easier for your side? Uh keep collaborating. Let's keep working together. Let's keep integrating. I think the more 
Um, we have transparency from tools like uh, Jamil and the diagnostic tools um, that Ethan has, the inventory tools that you both have, um, your ability to amplify that message to customers earlier in that buying cycle so that we can get that uh, credit evaluation done sooner rather than later. Um, ultimately, all of that, plus figuring out the transportation and the inspection and all of that, and the, sorry, the insurance is all going to lead to this reality being being accomplished, right? It takes a village, as they say, and uh, this this is a, a good panel of of villagers. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is. I think that's a good uh, audience takeaway, right? Is the collaboration? Mm -hmm. It's come up a couple times with just the amount of technologies and and tools out there, and uh, so us collaborating and and the audience here uh, as well. I think you can take that away. All right, Ethan, though, your your turn. What What's, what are these five new exciting things, or at least one of them that you got coming down the road? <laughs> yeah, some of them I'm not going to talk about, but uh, <laughs> some of them are uh, really along the lines of just making, you know, our passion is, and what gets me up in, in the morning is, um, and what I've been doing for years is just looking at dealerships and trying to figure out ways to make them more efficient and effective in what they do and uh, how they can communicate better. And that's through collaboration with, you know, you guys, uh, you know, collectively on this call. Uh, that's through other um, partners that we have. So I think what over the next uh, several years, what you're going to see from SOAR is us just tightening up that whole circle, pulling in partners that are really good at what they do, um, increasing our view into a truck as far as uh, even going um, to work with somebody uh, to start to look at fault codes and then understand like what part it's going to take and then tying that back into a DMS system to see if they have parts availability and just that efficiency of dealership operations and the communication within the dealership and also to the customer. Those are the kind of things that we're, we're going to be really focused on while also focusing on uh, our efforts to uh, identify quality prospects that are out in the marketplace so that we can tie customers to trucks and trucks to customers. And we've got a couple of different vehicles to do that. But uh, th those are those those are paths that we're uh, passionate about. And we've got a couple other pretty, pretty neat things up our sleeves that we're going to be uh, pulling out. But we we've just released our, um, uh, you know, our, our mobile app last year. Uh, that was a big one, you know, our our finance hub, and we've released a couple other products in the last last year. Uh, during the COVID time, dealers weren't really uh, looking for ways to market their inventory, so we went into a lot of development mode, and we developed a whole lot of stuff, and and we're rolling it out, and um, continue to as as we move forward. So that's All right, uh, well you're excited to see what's coming there, Ethan. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I, I did at the beginning say I, I'd circle back to AI, and we don't have tons of time, so I won't go too deep. So I'll ask it something that's maybe more beneficial to the audience. Like, do you guys have any tools that you recommend? Is there a favorite AI tool out there? There's so many, right? There's things that can take the transcription from a meeting you have and, and create a summary of notes from it, or obviously a lot of stuff on the image recognition stuff that Jamil is more familiar with. But just to the audience, or just, you know, it could be your personal uh, favorite. Uh, any Any AI tools out there that that you guys have played around with or would love to share with the audience? Jamil, you seem like the obvious one to take the lead on this. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, from, from a hobbyist perspective, obviously I'm, I'm sure everybody's been playing around with chat GPT. There's a pretty cool image, um, image based tool called Dolly, D-A-L-E. That, that That's pretty interesting. If you just want to um, you know, see what sort of um, imagery that um, artificial intelligence can create from, from your prompts, um, pretty cool. I think, um, yeah, from a from a business perspective, of course, um, you know, goes back to what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, AI is not going to solve all of your problems. It's more um, going to be just a, a you know a bow in your in your uh, sorry an arrow in your quiver um, mm -hmm. to help. Um, and there, there's lots of great providers out there that leverage it, whether they're they're building their own internally or 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 integrating others. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I, I re we're an image based analytics company, so I, I really like the, the Dolly, Dolly product. Um, if I was going to recommend one, yeah. Right so on. we've been playing around with a product called Gong and what's super exciting about it is it takes conversations that happen in one part of the organization and makes them word for word available 
and searchable in other parts of the organization. So that communication gap that exists between departments or that gap that between who's interfacing with the customer versus ultimately somebody else having to do an action on behalf of that customer is shortened dramatically when everyone has access to that conversation. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, I would say, you know, also it's going to be integrated into all the Microsoft products, all the Google products. Uh, so it's not if it's coming, it's here, it's already here. People are using it and it's only going to get uh, more widespread in its capabilities. And, you know, it's going to keep learning and, and getting better and better. Uh, and the adoptions just, I mean, it's its in this meeting right now. Uh, we've got the AI companion in, in, in our Zoom meeting here. So, uh, you know, it's it's here, and uh, I guess I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out just a little bit of a um, a caution for people is to not just put your full faith in AI, and have, as you have it right for you or do something for you. Uh, what we found is uh, that it'll it'll hallucinate and it'll make up stuff. Uh, so you need to be careful and you need to double check it um, just because you have a marketing person or somebody that's like, oh hey, you know, tell me about this truck or this truck body. It might make stuff up and uh, just flat out lie. And then you ask it, is that real? And I was like, no, nope, sorry, I, I hallucinated. I was just making, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, so it's, you know, you got to be a little bit careful with it. But at the same time, I think there's some, um, you know, from a technology standpoint, some exciting things coming down uh, with AI that I think we're all looking at and trying to figure out exactly the path uh, to use them. But yeah, definitely, you know, chat GPT or uh, any of them, I think, are are doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I'll uh, second that. You know, AI is not a hundred percent problem solved uh, solution. So that that hallucinated, uh, you know, responses, and you, know, you see that in images. Or if you zoom in, you're like, wait a second, it looked like a person when it was far out, but when I zoom in on it, it's the head's backwards or something. Not so know? much. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, yeah. I, we are down to our, our final minute or two. I don't know if there was any other uh, audience questions uh, that had come through. Uh, we got a minute or two if uh, anybody wanted to ask anything. Not yet. All right. And uh, so I liked how Gregory wrapped up his panel. Uh, if if anybody just joined here at the last second and they wanted uh, you wanted to give them your twenty seconds of of you know, vision or, or thoughts on technology growth or something you liked out of what we talked about today. I'll just uh, let, let us all wrap up here real quick. So um, Eric, I'll start with you. Uh, what's your wrap up of today's little panel here? Yeah. Uh, if technology is not at the center of how your organization is thinking about growth, it needs to be. So find someone, find several organizations through which uh, you can Leverage technology for future growth. Uh, transactions are happening online in particular every day. It is something that is growing exponentially and will continue to do so and uh, get on the bandwagon. Takes a village. <laughs> I, li I like that. I should have picked you last, but we'll see if Jamil or Ethan can wrap it up. <laughs> uh -oh. All right. Go ahead, Jamil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you know, we didn't talk a lot about the challenges, but maybe I'll, I'll go there in closing. You know, I think, you know, technology, technology adoption is always fighting against the status quo, right? And so I think one thing to keep in mind when evaluating technology solutions is, does it at least make my process, my operation 20% uh, better? And if, if you can get to that hurdle rate, then I think it's worth adopting technology. Um, and, and so, you know, for technologists in the room and in companies that, uh, that are technology uh, focused companies, it's really about showcasing that and, and proving that in a repeatable uh, and, and reliable manner. Uh, and then you'll get the adoption. So I just wanted to close with, with that since uh, we didn't really touch a lot on the challenges. Uh, yep. But thanks, Kevin. I really enjoyed it. Right on. Ethan, last words. Yep. Nope. I agree. Just know your your website and your uh, internet presence, your digital marketing presence is your only 24 hour salesman. So you need to make sure that it's it's spot on. All right. Well, th thanks to you three. I, I felt like uh, this this was a great panel and I, I enjoyed talking with you. I hope the audience was able to pull something away from this, whether it's a tip on an AI tool or hiring tips or, or just, you know, just getting to hear about uh, some companies that are in the technology space. 
uh, get to share their their thoughts. So um, I'll, I know uh, I think we've got Catherine uh, shifting up over here and wrapping us up for the day. Oh, and Steve, I think from our from our marketing team. So yeah, I will pass it on. Thanks all. It was a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you.